Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started again. What I want to do for this last part of class today is really just talk about structural modeling and some of the little kind of things that will either help you or get you in trouble as you go through and work with Revit to uh, model your structures after you've sort of decided on an overall strategy. Um, yeah, Revit overall does a very, very nice job with doing this, uh, but it definitely has its own sort of funky little sets of requirements relative to how to do it in a way that'll make your life uh, kind of work more easily. Yeah, in terms of structural modeling, there's two big things I want to focus on. One is the whole notion of a linked model, and then we want to talk about the specific techniques for modeling different types of structural elements. And a lot of you have had some experience because in 128, you did something where you modeled some basic structural elements. So we won't spend too much time there. But let me kind of just kind of focus on the notion of linking models a little bit because that gets to be very important as we start thinking about bringing together multidisciplinary models from a lot of different designers. So the idea behind this is really that although we could theoretically go through and create one model which includes everything. So an architectural model that has the structural in it, has the mechanical, has all those things. Very often we don't. Um, the, it would get to be a very heavy model. It would have an awful lot of information in there that might just sort of make it a little slow. But more importantly, if you think about who designs and who's responsible for different things, very often the structural engineer and what they're responsible for is a little bit different from what the architect is responsible for and where their liability and their contractual limitations stop. So we tend to set up models that don't put it all in one place where everyone can change things, but are isolated buckets where we can do work that we're responsible for, we can link to and share views of our models with other people. But we set it up so that if I'm the structural engineer and I'm sharing it with Brittany, that you can see, but you can't actually change the structure. Okay, so that there's always this level of indirection because you know, the responsibility is there. If you need something changed in the structure, you don't just change it because it would make your architecture better. You, you talk to me and then we change it together. Okay, so that's why we start to link models together. So in terms of linking models, there's actually a fairly straightforward procedure for doing it. What we're going to do, oops, not there, cancel that. Now that wasn't very good. Come back out. Let me load that back up again. As we start thinking about creating our linked model, we typically do something that looks like this. We'll often start with a structural template. We haven't talked about that very much. I've been working in a structural template, and you'll notice I have to keep on messing around to show the architectural elements, because the structural template's really optimized for structural work. It has a lot of structural elements. It has some things set up in the background to help out with structural analysis, but it doesn't have all the architecture elements. So we're going to start thinking about different models and views being oriented towards one discipline or another. Or what we're going to find is when we want to show everything together, then we create something called a coordination view, which shows all the elements equally, as opposed to sort of uh, subordinating some of them. So there's this notion of a structural template. It has all sorts of preloaded families. It has boundary conditions and the different structural framing elements and foundation elements. All those things are sort of built into the structural template. Okay, and so we tend to use that. We can copy those things into an architectural file, but it's actually easier if you just start out with a structural file. So what we're actually going to do is as follows. We're going to go take a look at the architectural file. Then we are going to go open a separate file using the structural template and then link in some things from the architectural file so that when we go through and create our structural file, it's in its own template independent of the architectural. Does that make sense? Okay. To do this, let's go ahead and we're going to start by going off and looking at an architectural model. And if you'd like to, out there in the uh, file server right now, out on Canvas, you'll find, oh, in session nine, there's a bunch of different files out there, all in something called structural modeling examples. And I'm just starting with zero, which is a simple building with no grids. 
And the way this is all set up is a whole series of files that build one on top of each other. So if at any point along the way you fall off, you can sort of jump in kind of with another file in just a few minutes or something like that. It's just another step in the process. But I'm going to start at step zero, which is theoretically that I have no grids. So I'm looking at my architectural template just so you get a sense of it. This is my little design for my building right now. If I sort of uh, open the section box a little, we can sort of uh, see inside. Let me kind of push that in a little further. You see, it's kind of a multi-story building. Down at the lower floor, the basement level, you'll see I have some sort of space down there. Oh, I have some sort of core coming on down there. Up here on the, what I'll consider the first floor, it's the first floor with some sort of terrace out beyond it. Up here on my second floor, I have more of a balcony, which is partially over the space, but also partially unenclosed. I have a two-story space, like an atrium in there. And this is, yeah, this may be very similar to where you are right now. It's kind of an initial model of what an architectural approach for the building might look like. You'll see I haven't done very much with the facade yet. If I go flipping around, you'll sort of see I have some sort of notions about some solid walls versus some curtain walls. And again, this would all can move around a little bit, but this is a starting point. It's just sort of getting us uh, going. So as you start thinking about your structural model, okay, or about your architectural model and what we'll need, there's a couple of things that'll be helpful to kind of get the structural engineering going. There's a notion of grids, and grids is something you probably don't have in your architectural model, but it's nice to add them in there to provide a basis for mapping in the structure. You know, what I currently have in this model is a grid A and a grid 1, just in that upper corner. Okay. Where I've located those grids really is sort of related to this notion of where I think the grid line and the structure will be relative to that outer core of the wall. I'm going to sort of have my structure be a little bit inside and adjust the walls to it. So I have sort of a grid in there. But let me go ahead and put some more grids in and then we'll just uh, from that like a, oh, kind of a start adjusting things so they sort of match the grids. So here's grid one. Grid one sort of is at a sort of a sensible location right now. As I think about another grid going horizontally across, one thing I want to think about is just sort of what the maximum span is between the different elements. If I'm going to go for, oh, somewhere around 20 by 20, that's a good guess of how big a structure may be. I could go ahead and put another grid about halfway down and another grid right towards the end. Again, nothing special about this, but I might just go say copy. I'll put one, oh, about halfway down. Then I'll make another copy of it. I'm going to put it right down, down in there. Now, as I'm working with my grids, a couple things to note. One is the numbers are a little bit different. I have one, then six and seven. Um, it'll always sort of pick up the last number and increment it. So if I want to change that to two and three, which would probably be a little more common, I could do that. If I was continuing to go, oh, if I wanted to have a grid that would sort of be the front wall of that basement, I might have a four right about in there. And maybe even a five all the way down there. And just don't be afraid of grids. Grids are really just there as a framework to help you organize things. We can always get rid of some grid lines later and move them around. That's OK. But just as a general rule of thumb, let's go ahead and kind of check this out in terms of the uh, spacing. We'll go through and do a little annotating. How about I'll put a dimension in here? Let's take a look. That first one is about 28 feet away. That's actually not too bad. That's actually pretty good. In general, as you're thinking about grids, you're going to go for locations that are, you know, kind of plausible in terms of beam lengths. If I had 30 foot beams or something like that, that'd probably be fine. Okay. I could, if I did it this way, it looks like altogether I have about 56 feet. So I could break that up into three segments or two segments. It really just sort of depends on, you know, whether I want longer, deeper beams or shorter, uh, squattier beams or shallower beams. 
In terms of the dimension, even these dimensions aren't too bad. 28, 28 foot 6, those are plausible. Implausible dimensions are 28 foot 1 and 5 eighths, or 28 foot 3 and 6 seventeenths. It's, you, you don't want things that are, in general, when people are laying out, they tend to like whole inches, half feet, things like that. And what will tend to happen is those will sort of be the, you know, the skeletal force, the dominant lines, and then other things will just be positioned relative to them. Oh, down in here, like here's a good example. Okay, went down to 20 foot four. Again, it really depends if I could push that out or in. You know, oh, I could decide that I want to make that, oh, let's make that 22 feet. Okay, and then maybe for this other one, I'm also going to make that 22 feet or 23 feet. There's just some logic to it. Okay, there's, I don't have a precise formula for how to do that. It's just there's some sort of logic about having reasonable dimensions. If you're working for a new building, if you're working for an older building, you may have what you have, just sort of based on how it was done. Okay, similarly in this other direction over here, oh, I got this A. This is going to get into, do I want to think about this building being, could I do a, like just three column lines? Do I need four or five? Maybe for this one, I'm going to put a couple more in there. I'll go through and say, let me put one in here that goes about halfway. Then I'll put one in here that goes the whole way. Then about halfway again. in the whole way here. Now, let me undo that for just a second to show you kind of a trick that is a useful one. When you again copy this first one over here, to about that half one wherever it is, what I can do is just change that to B because now what will happen is as I copy the next one, it'll pick up the C. Other things you can do, some people like to offset the grids. That's kind of not a bad way. These actually happen to be about 25 feet, or 20 foot, there, that's 25 feet across there. If I want to go through and place grids that way, I can say architecture. Let's do the grid and I'll do it with an offset of 25 feet. And that's not too bad, although that looks a little shy on that one. So I'm going to figure out over there whether I'm going to split the difference. Or if I'm going to somehow have all the difference taken up in the last one. OK, I got grids. They're hanging around. This is looking pretty good. I got 25, 25, 25, 25, and a little left over. Maybe for this last one, I'm going to have to pull this out to, oh, see if I can get it a little bit closer to the wall, maybe 28. Okay, and then I'll split the difference here and call it 26 on one side, 26 on the other. That doesn't look right. There's seven over there. Okay, but I'm just starting by getting the grids down. The reason, again, that I want to get the grids down, and even if you haven't done it yet, look at your building in terms of uh, the elevations, in terms of where the uh, levels are. You want to get all those in a pretty good shape because we're going to use those grids and levels to coordinate between the different models. So if you get them set down now, it'll make your life a little bit easier for moving forward. Okay, when you have all these things settled, you can go ahead and do yourself a nice save. They are saved away, and now you are ready to go through and kind of working with a structural template, linking something to this. So this is all architectural. Okay, so let me pause there for a second. You got some grids? You got some levels? Okay, if you got some grids and levels, we can now go ahead and make a structural file that will use them. So if you don't have anything, if you haven't been following along precisely, no worries, just go ahead and open up. I think if you open up the with grids, 
There's one that's already done over here. Looks like I have some grid lines in a slightly different location, but that'll work just fine for you too. Okay, here's what we want to do. When we are going to link to this architectural model from the structural model, we, in order to link to it, we have to close the architectural model since you can't go ahead and have it open for editing as well as for linking at the same time. So I'm going to close that away. I'm now going to say new. And for new, I'm going to say for a project, create something that uses the structural template as opposed to the architectural template. Okay, again, that'll kick in all the structural infrastructure. So I can choose it. You'll see when it opens up. Okay, there's nothing in there just yet. That's okay. We're going to link in our architectural file, very much like we link all those files together between all the different uh, buildings on the shopping center site. We'll say, let's go ahead and insert. Link a Revit model. I'm going to go for the one that has the grids. Auto origin origin. There's this whole notion about what the origin is. If you want them to be in sync with each other, origin to origin is the best relationship. So I can pull that in. Okay. You'll see that so far, it doesn't look like I have much. I have some grids in there. Okay. I can see a little bit of a frame for where the floor is right there. I can see the stairway that came across, but I have some grid lines. But I don't actually have grid lines that I can sort of move or manipulate. If I try to touch anything in that linked model, you'll see that it all turns blue. I get a blue box around it. It's my look but can't touch. It's a linked model. So what I have to do in order to make those accessible to me is just copy things out of that model. Can so once you have a model and it's linked together, actually as long as we're here, let's go ahead and save this. Save this. This is going to be called O0B, the structural model. So I got my architectural model, I got my structural model, which doesn't have much in it besides a link right now. If I want to grab the grids across so I can work with them over here, what I'm going to do is under the Collaborate tab, we're going to turn on something called Copy Monitoring. And what is Copy Monitoring doing? It lets you take things over in another linked file, make copies of them in your file, and then notifies you if anything changed. Okay, so if the architect changes anything, you find out about it. So I can say select the link, grab the link, okay, and now I'm in a special mode, it's copy monitor mode. I can tell I'm there because notice how the toolbar turned green, the tab is green, and I have this little finish and cancel button over here. Okay, so what it's waiting for me to do now is say, okay, show me the things that you want to copy, that you want to pull out. And how I can do that is choose the copy tool and say, I want that grid. It'll copy that across. I want that grid, that grid, that grid, and that grid. So what you're basically doing is copying this framework in. So I'm going to get the grids in both directions. Super. So now I have those same 10 grids from the architecture file also copied into my structural model. Okay, and that's going to be useful because now I can start placing columns and beams on those. Okay, and it'll be linked back to the architectural model. So if something moves over there, the grids will move and then my columns will move. Okay, so you definitely want to get the uh, columns or the grids kind of set up. The other thing that I'm going to highly encourage you to do when you first do this is to also kind of go through and copy the levels. And let's show you what I mean by that. These are the levels. You notice there's two levels. You see level one and level two, which is at 10 feet. Those are the default levels that came as part of the structural template. These other levels, minus 14, 0, 14, and 28, those are the levels that came out of the architectural template or the architectural file. So if I want to use the same levels, and I do so that my columns are the same height and my beams are in the same locations, if I want to go through and grab all those things, okay, what I have to do is just do the copy from here also. I'll say 
copy. I'm going to copy uh, level zero, even though, or level one, even though it doesn't appear very different, it'll just lock those two things together. I'm going to copy level two. Watch what happens when I copy level two. The level two in the structural file will move up. Level three, it'll create a new level that's right on top. And level zero, it'll create a new level that's right on top. So now I actually have four levels in this file too. Now, you may wonder, you say, oh, but I don't see four levels. I still see just only the few that are in there. And the reason is, by default, when it goes through and creates these, let me go ahead and finish first. So choose Finish to save all these changes. Okay. When it creates these new levels, it doesn't automatically create floor plan views. If you want to create floor plan views, that's a separate step. You can go over and under the View tab, say that I want plan views. Have fun. Okay, and I'm going to get level zero and level three. Okay, and now I actually have those over in the list of structural plans too. So, you know, it doesn't create them for you automatically. Okay, so now I have grids, I have levels. We are ready to go through and start uh, kind of doing our coordination. Now let's talk briefly about what's in here so we can start placing some elements. Okay, you'll see that I see the grids. I actually see the floor and the stairway too from the linked model. I don't see the walls though. I don't see anything like that in this view. And if I want to start placing my columns, it might be helpful for me to look at that. Maybe not necessarily, but it'd be nice to sort of see those things. So what I can do is create a view that turns those on. Like right now, this is level one, and it's strictly the structural. Over here, it says discipline, it's structural. So that's my structural framing plan. If I want to create another view, which is a coordination view, a view that'll show the structural as well, what I can do is duplicate level one. Okay, I'm going to rename that to be level one coordination. And I'll change its discipline from structural to coordination. Okay. And it didn't make a very big difference. The one thing that happened was the walls popped in. Okay. So right now I have two views. I have a coordination view that shows the walls. I have level one, which is a structural view, which doesn't show the walls. Okay. And that's going to be useful to you to have the two different views. So, you know, as you place a structural element, you're still going to put them in the structural file, but you might want to sort of see where the walls are relative to that just to help you as you work. So, coordination. Okay, so we have a model, we have a view set up, some coordination views. We can set up some other views too, like right now, this is just a 3D view of the analytical model, which is not very interesting. Let me duplicate this and sort of say, we'll make it a 3D structural. Okay. And as structural elements get added in, they'll be added in here. Let me duplicate that one in turn. And I'm going to say, make it a 3D coordination. And for that, I'm going to change the discipline to coordination. Looks like it's there, I'm not seeing anything. Let me go ahead and do my little visibility graphics in here. Looks like I have to show my model categories. Okay, there it is. Even here's 3D structural. Looks like visibility graphics. I have to turn on show model categories. Okay, super. So now we have a couple different views. The real point about creating all these different views is really just having a place where, as we work, we can see what is only the structure, what is the structure and the architecture together, what are the analytical lines. So as we have all these, OK. Want to help Teddy if we need to. OK, if we have all these and we want to start placing things, the whole notion of starting to place the basic uh, structural elements in place 
looks something like this. I think if you saw it in like, you know, 128, you're sort of familiar with what we're gonna do here. If I go to level one, for example, and I say that I wanna put some structural columns in here, because I usually start with structural columns, I'll go to the structure tab and say, let's get some columns. I can choose whether I want to put in concrete or wood or whatever it is that I want to put in there. I'm just going to go through and put in some uh, steel columns right now. I always have the choice. Remember this about depth versus height. If I choose depth, I'm going to go from level one down to level zero. If I choose height, I'm going to go from level one up to level two, just kind of whichever way you prefer. And I tend to think in terms of height, although a lot of structural engineers like to approach it the other way. Doesn't matter. I'll say height up to level two, or I could say depth down to level zero, either way. And now I can place these columns in place. The key is actually just to make sure that when the column goes in place, you're putting it right at the intersection, because if it's right at the intersection, then if the grids move, then the column will move too. So if I place it right there, and you can see them both activating, that's going to sort of hit the grid intersection. I can come over and again do the same thing here. But what's so common as a way to do this is, since we tend to put columns at the grid intersections, I'll just choose at grids. Zoom out a little. And I'll just go through and choose these grid lines. Grid line, control click, control click. Get all the grids in this location direction. Then I'll get the other grid or the intersecting grids. And notice what happens. Wherever there's an intersection, it's going to suggest it's a little bit gray right now. It hasn't quite put them in there, but it's a little bit gray that it would put a column there. Control click our way down here. Super. When you say finish, it puts them all in there. So if I go back over to my 3D structural, you see I got a bunch of those columns kind of hanging around in there. Now you'll notice that the columns aren't necessarily in the right places everywhere. In fact, as I think about my structure here, I may want to cut out a bunch of these columns because you know I don't want a forest of columns depending on what my structure looks like. I may not, for example, want these columns or these columns out here on the terrace. Maybe I just want them at the lower floor below. There's a lot of things I can do in terms of taking them out. I can customize it as much as you want, but if you start with the whole notion of just putting the columns in there, you're in pretty good shape. Okay. Typically, on top of that, we'll go through and put some beams. Again, I'll keep it really simply supported right now. I tend to put in beams by 3D snapping. and bring them across. Okay. As we go through and put our beams in, there's just a slight variation I want to give you on that. This has to do with just sort of placement stuff. You might remember from A that whole notion about beams and since they didn't want to conflict with the floor plate, the actual sandwich of the concrete and the steel decking, that we typically had to lower them just a little bit. Concrete was okay to keep it right up at floor level two, but steel we always had to lower a little bit so that it would be at the bottom of the decking and it wouldn't, inter wouldn't interfere. So based upon our floor, which we're gonna put in here, we can find some sort of floor and kind of see what's going on. I got a nice little three inch floor with a two inch deck that would be five inches thick. So if I'm gonna use that, what I'd wanna do is just lower the beams five inches so they would always ride just underneath the decking. So super, I'll say over here, just grab all those beams. And I'll say, let's give them an offset at the top of minus five inches just kind of sends them slightly downhill. Okay, now as we are working, just to kind of complete this for today, we'll do a couple things. One is we'll say that, hey, 
This structure, even though it's very incomplete, we might want to copy down to level one, zero. We might also want to copy it up to level two, kind of at both those levels. So what I can do is just go ahead and even though this is incomplete right now, just for the purpose of finishing us up today, choose those. Say, let me go ahead and grab the beams and the columns. Okay, copy them to the clipboard and then I'll paste it. That's gonna be interesting. If, oh, I'm gonna think about whether it's I have to do it to one and three or if I have to do it to zero and two. Because beams often think of that themselves as belonging to the level above, even though I drew them at level one. Let's just sort of see. Okay. So we have a little forest of these things now. This forest is inaccurate in any sense in terms of, oh, we're going to start doing some things next time to start customizing it, to create cantilevers and create all sorts of interesting effects besides a lot of columns that are hanging out this way. But this is enough to get us started. Just the way I would typically finish this would be to say, oh, I need to put some isolated footings at the bottom of the columns. I'll put them down at level zero. So I can put some footings down in here. So at some level, you can go through and create the basic grid, the framework of the structural columns and all that type of stuff fairly easily. But you know, we're going to start changing around and doing things a little bit differently. So let me finish that. And just as a precursor to sort of let you sort of start thinking about these things, we'll do things like, oh, and this is where we'll go next time. If, for example, this is feeling a little crowded down here at the bottom, you don't want to have that column there, you don't need to have that column there. If you decide that instead you'd like to take that column out, okay, and go through and pull that across like this, we can have a longer column that spans and keeps that open so that we don't have a column there. And that's perfectly cool in terms of doing that. Columns don't always have to link up one after the other. There's a structural implication if I have a point load coming down in the middle of that beam, that beam is a little bit heavier, a little bit deeper to support that, but I don't necessarily have to have things line up all the time. Or another consideration you might think about would be, for example, oh, I don't want these guys here at the end. I'd really like to have a balcony that just sort of cantilevers out. So I can do something like pull that out to form a cantilever. Okay. And then even if I want to put the beam in the other direction, just come through and snap from here. And oh, it's hard to do this in 3D. I should do that. In, not, I shouldn't do that in 3D because <laughs> it's really hard to do that. And, you know, that would actually bring it back triangularly. Actually, I'll do this. I'll do it the other direction. I'll bring it from the end over here to this piece over there. Okay, that's snapping in 3D. So we can start having cantilevered corners in there too. So what I want to get you to do is a think about where your grid is. So we have a basic framework, but then. B, think about where you're going to violate your grid, where you really have some interesting structural feature. You have a big atrium where you don't want columns coming down in the middle, or you have a big clear span with a lot of glass, and you, again, don't want to block it off with kind of a rectangular grid of columns. So just be thinking overall about a kind of organizing framework, and then we'll think about where we're going to break it and why. And for each of those different cases, and this is what we'll do next time, we'll think about how we take out columns, how we offset columns, how we put cantilevers in and place the columns, or maybe even hang things from the roof instead of putting columns in there. So just because it starts out as a very rectangular grid doesn't mean it has to end up there, but it's usually a good starting point to get going, and then we systematically differ from it. Okay? Meeting. Okay, so let us pause and adjourn there for today. We'll pick up more structural modeling in terms of how we do sort of cool and interesting things. But if you want to get going between now and then, that little exercise is really, it's just like this. Go ahead, 20 by 50, couple grid lines, put columns, or put beam, or columns, put beams, put foundations. Okay, and just kind of get it framed up just so you, you get that little piece under your belt and then it will be a little bit easier before we go off to yours. Okay, let us adjourn for today.